Please note, today's session is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much. On behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to today's Implementation Science webinar. We are joined by our great speakers, but before we get started, a brief word about logistics. All lines are in listen-only mode. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to so please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, this session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us to avoid any background noise. We encourage questions and comments. Questions can be submitted by using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question in the provided Q&A field and hit submit. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during today's call. We will be using the chat panel to share resources throughout today's talk. You may need to activate the appropriate panel using the menu options found at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we recommend navigating to the View menu at the top of your monitor and selecting Hide Non-Video Participants, as this will give you the best glimpse of our great speakers. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. David? Thank you, Sarah, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we uh, are in a state of excitement because we are just about a month away, or a little bit less than that, from the 13th Annual Conference on the Science of Dissemination and Implementation. Uh, and we hope to see uh, you and many others uh, join us in this uh, interesting virtual mode. Uh, and we thought it would be great as part of our uh, monthly webinar series to have a chance to talk with the co-chairs about how the conference has uh, been, been doing in, in recent years, what's exciting uh, as, as uh, we're anticipating uh, another sort of record-breaking in different ways uh, conference, uh, and really to walk through whatever you want to know, um, and that's the purpose of these sessions, to walk through whatever you want to know about the conference, about how we see the field moving forward, and, and, and anything else under the sun. So as Sarah had said, uh, we will be driven by the questions that you give us, uh, and in the meantime, we'll give you some sort of foundational information that might be helpful. But, but at any time, really do feel free to uh, type in what, what you want to know, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, so you'll see uh, the smiling faces in front of you, uh, myself on the left, uh, dressed far more nicely than I am at the moment, but that goes with the territory. Uh, and then uh, Gila and, and Lisa, the three of us have been involved for a number of years in, in the leadership, the development of this conference. It's great to have both of them there. I remember Gila uh, first meeting her. I was at the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, and, and Gila was then a new member of the implementation science team here at the National Cancer Institute, and I, and I believe uh, was uh, sort of looking to get a good sense of what kinds of activities were going on in this space across the NIH. And so I remember sitting in my office at, at the NIMH and, and having a chance to sit down with uh, with her, and and that was the beginning of this of this wonderful collaboration of how we and and the team and the field can really move forward uh, to try and make the most of efforts to improve health and healthcare. Uh, we had done five of these conferences uh, as uh, with the NIH and with uh, the VA and with a number of other partners, uh, AHRQ as well. Um, and we got to a point where it was hard for a while for those of us at the NIH to run these large meetings. And so we really needed to, this was around uh, 2012, 2013, we really needed to find a new model for how we could both continue to grow the conference uh, and how we could better uh, balance the expertise needed in, in, in running an ever larger event uh, with the uh, appropriate outreach and the appropriate way to grab more of uh, the, the necessary in organizations and folks to involve. And I remember getting on the Metro uh, and heading from Rockville, Maryland, down to Washington, D.C., and having a chance uh, to sit down with Lisa, who is uh, the, the president and CEO of Academy Health, and start to talk about how we could see the, uh, the integration of all of this expertise around dissemination and implementation research, all of this expertise around health services research in general, uh, and really work in a partnership to try and bring in ever greater opportunity for the field to connect on what we've learned and to connect on the challenges that we need to overcome. And so from that initial conversation, I think has, has developed a, a beautiful partnership uh, which is now in its sort of seventh year, specifically with this con or eighth year, uh, specifically with this con well, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So I guess that's six. Six, uh, six entries into uh, this wonderful uh, series of conferences. And so it's great to have both Gila and Lisa uh, together. And uh, just wanted to start out actually in a way that we often start out with these fireside chats is asking each of you to sort of look back in in the rearview mirror and talk a little bit about how you first came uh, to DNI research, to implementation science as an area 
uh, that you thought was worthy of concentrating on. So maybe just in order of what we have here, Gila and then Lisa, you want to jump in? Sure. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> so I, I first came to implementation science without knowing it was implementation science, um, which is probably uh, familiar for a lot of folks. But I was a postdoc at NCI in our Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genomics studying um, the health effects of radiation exposure and specifically medical exposure to radiations and CT scans in, in particular. So at that time that I was at NCI, this was a time where CT scans for diagnostic purposes were huge in the news, um, finding that there was all of this excess exposure. At the same time, a publication had come out that 30,000 excess deaths um, we're going to be expected due to CT or 30,000 excess cancers, sorry, cancer incidents was going to be due to excessive use of these CT scans. And um, at the same time, the Choosing Wisely campaign was just launching. So this was back in 2008-2009. And um, while I was looking at the epidemiologic um, research on uh, radiation exposure and cancer, what was really, um, what I felt most passionate about was understanding how do we reduce the use of CT scans and the excess use of these scans. And um, that's uh, essentially how I came to implementation science and discovered this is where all the, to me, the most fascinating questions are to the hardest problems. So. Great, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to echo some of the points that Gila made. So um, in that um, I came to this field um, sort of not knowing it was a field. Um, and that first started when I did my postdoc in health services research and health policy. You know, I had worked in the pu public health department. I'm a pediatrician. And, um, and so that first helped me understand what health services research is. But I didn't I knew from that training and then my work after that at HHS that getting research into practice, getting research into policy was a huge barrier. And, you know, how do we do that? And I didn't know that there was this whole field studying how to do that better. Um, so I'm embarrassed, but I, um, I came to, I think I first became aware of improvement science at Cincinnati Children's when I was there from 2007 to 2011. Um, and that's when um, I first came to the conference. So, um, yeah, and, and it's really, it's, it's been, I, I want to echo what David said about the great partnership. It has been six years. Um, a lot has grown and changed over that time. I know we'll talk about that, but um, it, what hasn't changed is um, the, the value of the partnership. So, thanks. Yeah, no, thanks both of you. Uh, so you'll see uh, if uh, I think it should have popped up, there is a polling window, at least I'm seeing it here. Uh, and we just wanted to get an initial sense from everybody who's joined us today, whether uh, you like us have attended uh, the annual conference of the Science uh, of Dissemination, Implementation, Research and Health. Uh, and so uh, would encourage you, I'm going to, I'm going to hit yes myself. There I go. And I'm submitting. Uh, so you can do the same. Um, and, uh, yeah, while, while we're doing that, since both uh, uh, Lisa and Gila have attended this conference, I wonder if we could start with uh, each of your first experiences with the conference and, and just uh, tell us a little bit about what was that experience like being uh, in, in, this, uh, in this group. And, and maybe we'll start with Lisa and then go to Gila. Sure. So um, I first came, as I alluded to, uh, when I found out about the conference when I was at Cincinnati Children's. And um, and I was active at Academy Health. And um, when I was at the conference, um, I realized I didn't know the community at all. I, I learned so much about what the agencies were funding um, and the frameworks and the methods. And uh, so it, it was kind of eye-opening. Um, oh, my thing just zoomed in tremendously. I don't know, my WebEx camera is acting up. So it'll keep it dynamic, I guess. Um, and um, but what was interesting is after I went to the event, then I came back to, some, to sort of my health services research home or community and asked so many people, you know, have you been? Do you attend? And and there was, seemed to be a real disconnect between the sort of DNI research community and 
the broader HSR community, and I see them as integrally linked and learning from each other. So, so that was my first experience. And, and my whole life I've been a connector. So, so my goal in, in entering the partnership was to make this connection more effective because I think both fields benefit um, from each other. Great, Kila. I, I, that's one of the many things I love about you, Lisa, that you are a connector and a binner, and it's made for such a um, great collaboration. I, uh, my first experience, so I don't know if you would count that sort of sixth annual gap where we had the working meeting, but um, I joined the IS team just a few months before that sixth annual gap where instead of having a large conference, we had these three working meetings. And Russ Glasgow and I, Russ was um, at the time the head of our group, and he and I were coordinating the one meeting that was focused on standardized measurement and reporting. David, when he was at NIMH, did the training, and um, uh, Lori, I think it was Lori Descharm, who I see is on the call. Hi, Lori. Um, ran the um, study designs one, if I'm remembering correctly. So that was really a fantastic way to be introduced to the field because I got to be in the room with um, three different groups of experts in those areas, and it was just a, a fabulous orientation to the field. But my first time attending the big conference was obviously the first time I organized the big conference with Lisa and David, and um, it was hugely exciting and not surprising after that work, set of working meetings to see, you know, I, I'm an epidemiologist by training. Most of the large conferences I've been to have been broad public health or epidemiology conferences, and um, there was just a different feel in this community. It really is such a special scientific community. Um, and I hope it's okay if I insert one brief anecdote that's not exactly an answer to this question, but at CERC last year, I was in a workshop, and one of the attendees I was sitting next to said to me, have you ever attended the annual conference on the science of dissemination and implementation in health? It's my favorite conference. And I don't think I've ever felt prouder in that moment than I did then. Yes, there is a lot of pride that, that I think has gone in uh, and, and, and a lot of uh, wonderful sort of credit deserved for all those who have participated in it. As you can see, uh, the screenshot is of the, uh, is, is from the website for this year, and you can see we have this phenomenal keynote speaker, uh, Ashi Jha, who many folks have been listening to for recent months about uh, the ways in which we can do our best to uh, maximize our response uh, to uh, coronavirus. And, and as you can see from what he's planning to talk about, uh, maybe areas that we haven't done as well and what can we learn from them. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we've all had a lot of pride. And, and it's, it's also nice to see that some of the conversations that have uh, started at the annual conference have also continued in these other wonderful conferences that have uh, gotten uh, gotten off the ground uh, since and 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 really um, enable these complementary discussions moving forward around methods around measurement around specific areas of health. Um, so thanks for the for the initial responses to the polls. It seems like we're pretty well split between those who have joined us in the past and those who have not, and of course those who haven't. We would love. Uh, to see you online uh, in about a month. Um, we do have a second poll question, which I think goes to for those people who have attended. Uh, and so you'll see that, just getting a sense of how many uh, have been have been one-timers, how many have, uh, have gone through uh, more than that. Uh, I suppose you could do A and B if you're one. But um, please feel free to let us know uh, the degree to which you followed these series, because that's always helpful for us. I also want to encourage you to, whenever you like, uh, submit those specific questions that you have. And particularly for those of you who haven't attended, love to know how we can help to orient you to uh, how this conference has evolved over time. I wonder with the next question, and maybe I can ask Gila and then Lisa to comment on, can you talk a little bit about just the partnership, the way in which the conference uh, is, is organized in terms of the participants in the planning of it and, and just anything you want to say about how that partnership has, has worked over recent years. Um, so yeah, happy to start. So we, um, so in addition to Academy Health and, and the National Institutes of Health, um, every year we work very closely with our partners at PCORI and namely Bridget Gaglio, who I also saw is on the call, as well as um, 
AHRQ, the VA, the CDC. Um, I'm blanking all of a sudden. Like it must be nervous, but I feel like there's a very key player I'm leaving out. Lisa, who am I forgetting? Or <laughs> David? But, well, we have other sponsors, but I think you've got all the partners. Oh, okay, good. I know in the past, the WT Grant has been um, also heavily involved in RWJF. But, um, and then just across the NIH, there have been so many um, institutes and centers who have been really instrumental in shaping the conference agenda. And so it's it's just been such a, a privilege to work with everyone, and um, I feel like, you know, we've all been working together now for several years, and um, it's just been great to see how, um, you know, how, how our relationship as an organizing committee has evolved. But um, I've already kind of forgotten what the question was, David, but I think what I really um, like about you know, this partnership is that it really is a very democratic process that we start, you know, we start right off the bat talking about what are the big themes, what are the important questions, and who would be great to hear from around those areas. And we have a really engaged group um, with, um, and we come with lots and lots of suggestions, more than we can accommodate, but we also have this process where we will vote on, you know, and see what rises to the top and then discuss those things. So I've really valued that um, that process. So I'll, I'll you know, echo and, and uh, everything Gila said, um, you know, uh, Academy Health has a few conferences. Mm -hmm. We have sort of, we have, you know, the annual research meeting, the DNI, and then we co-locate now our data palooza and uh, policy conference. And each one is unique. And uh, but I would say to Gila's point about democratic, um, you know, this this really involves the most people sort of on it. Others are kind of planning committees that come and give advice, but a lot of the working goes on sort of after that. And this is very much a participatory uh, planning group. And then obviously, I, I want to add to the partnership uh, frame is also all the theme leaders who chair. Uh, the, the various themes um, and the reviewers who participate in those in all those themes because the number of abstracts have gone up over the years and um, and you know it, it's if it weren't for the work of all of those volunteers and some of them you know end up being you know more involved over the years uh, it wouldn't have the kind of scientific heft and and value that the conference now has so and I think the partnership side, it, the, we forgot to mention Gila, the other partner has been, in addition to the ones you mentioned, uh, in terms of sponsorship, has been Kaiser Permanente. And the other aspect of partnership that I, I think of when we talk about the conference, and I've seen trend over time, is the importance of bringing in non-researchers. So the majority of the conference participants are NIH or other funded investigators. Uh, but increasingly, they're working in partnership with communities, in partnership with policymakers, in partnership with health systems leaders. And I think that connection to the real world implementation, so, and, and this will be no surprise to David and Gila, as much as I appreciate, it's just my bias, the frameworks, and it's important. I'm just impatient. I want this evidence implemented. I want all that amazing knowledge that is presented uh, and approaches at the conference to actually change care for communities. And I think the urgency, um, I think Sachin James said he stole it from somebody else, but he called it the fierce urgency of now with what we're seeing with COVID and, um, and disparities. I mean, the need to act is just so, in, so obvious and so, I, I want to bring a little bit of that sense of urgency to our community as well, and I think Ashish will. So, partnership in many, many ways. Yeah, thank can you. I add and I think, one, oh, go ahead. Can I just want to add one thing to that, and that um, uh, um, building off of what Lisa said, and Lisa, that's another aspect of our partnership that I so deeply value is that you're always pushing us to move beyond the research community, and I love that you guys have incorporated these scholarships for patients and for practitioners to the conference and bringing in more of those voices has been, um, you know, tremendous. Yeah, so you'll see the uh, visual has changed. Uh, this will not be what it looks like this year. We do not want any sort of super spreader kind of things, but this is 
a fond memory and something that we will likely return to again. For those of you who did uh, indicate that you had attended a meeting, take a quick look and see if you can find yourself there. You can uh, just just uh, let us know uh, if, if you see yourself. I see several people, lots of people I recognize. Um, but uh, you know, this is this has been in the past a really wonderful large gathering, and and will be again uh, in the future. But on that theme, uh, and Lisa, you you teed it off very nicely. I wonder if each of you can talk a little bit about as we turn our attention to this conference uh, that is upcoming, and we think about the themes that are sort of uh, central. Uh, to it. Can, talk, can you talk a little bit about that sense of urgency and how it sort of made its way into how you see the conference trying to uh, handle uh, the, this as well as just ongoing urgency to, to, to try and uh, maximize health and health care? And Lisa, maybe you could start and then Gila? Well, um, whew, um, you know, I, I think that um, it's uh, I've seen an evolution, as Gila alluded to, um, to who attends, and I've and so and I've seen more health systems people. You know, they might be on the improvement research sort of, you know, like the phenotype of the folks I worked with at Cincinnati Children's that they're involved in care delivery, but they're doing improvement and they're applying DNI methods like Heather Kaplan and others, and you have them in your cancer community uh, research community as well. And, and I think that, um, and then there's more just straight folks who are in health systems and they're not doing the research, but they're really committed to bringing that uh, implementation forward. So um, I, I think that naturally brings in a sense of urgency. And so I'm, one of the things I, like you guys, I wish we could all be together. I, I you know, it's so odd to me to think that this was just a year ago and, and our world has changed so dramatically and our, our assumptions about what is possible. Uh, and, and one of the things that we know for the con for any virtual event is the networking part is much harder. Now we're building in some networking functions and features. I hope you all attend and you all tell us whether, how well we did. Um, but that networking with people on the front lines, I think is critical for uh, feeding, sort of lighting that fire in our bellies to say, we can make a difference here. And, and I think DNI Science has a big role to play in stepping up to the pandemic and disparities, especially. I mean, we have a big evidence base on disparities, describing them and health inequities. Actually, we know much less on, on how to take small studies of, of successful efforts to intervene on the disparities and social determinants to actually implement them. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Gila, did you want to add in? And 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 I was curious if uh, any impressions that you have. Just there's the broad sense of urgency, and then there's the way in which that may have influenced the specific themes of the plenary sessions. Any comments on that would be awesome as well. Sure. Yeah, I can talk about that the the urgency, but I'll also just add, and this is maybe somewhat of a tangent, but still I think relevant is that you know last year. I think it was a third of the audience was attending DNI for the very first time. So in terms of um, ur urgency, in terms of shaping the science or shaping science, and um, implementation science is kind of a paradigm shift in how you think about scientific questions. Uh, in terms of you're not just thinking about what is the best thing to address the problem, but how do we move it forward? So no matter what you're focusing on, and so I was super excited to see there's so many new people to um, the field, and so the urgency to train researchers to be thinking about this and how to do this science. So I, I am glad we've incorporated more and more of the capacity building within the science within the conference in terms of workshops. But in terms of, so that was just an aside, but I think it's still relevant, um, is in, in terms of the urgency of our time and um, how it shaped the, the conference themes this year, for sure, I think, you know, for all of March and April, I feel like all I did was read the news um, and, and then again in June. And so in terms of shaping the themes this year, I think, you know, Lisa, David, and I really felt like it, the the importance of implementation science is, has never been more palpable. If we are going to do anything, we really need to speed research to practice and make sure that research is relevant and 
So the themes of, you know, the dynamism of evidence, um, the, you know, what is the best way to innovate, and how do you get policy change and think about policy? Um, I mean, I think those themes were really shaped by what are the most important sort of pandemic-related questions we're faced with, and how do we make sure our science is being used the best that it can to address this issue. Um, and, and then that was sort of the initial thinking. And then, you know, the challenge is of, you know, and, and highlighting the importance of systemic racism and influencing all of those things, um, you know, thinking about, you know, even in the ways in which we're generating evidence and how applicable that evidence is to different communities as well as, you know, policy impact. So I think, um, in, in both of those fronts, it's really a thread that um, we, we've been thinking about throughout all aspects of the conference. Great. Thanks for that. Lisa, anything to add on the, the themes? Uh, not specifically on the themes. Um, so I, but maybe I'll bring it up now because I don't see it in your questions later. But you tell me if you want me to bring it up later is, you know, Aguila mentioned some of the things that we've done over time to bring in more of that training and capacity building, which we'll speak to. Um, but that's not all that we've done. You know, we've done, and I was telling David and Gila and Sarah just before we started that when I asked Tamara Infante, who's uh, our sort of power manager who makes all this happen behind the scenes with all, all the partners and volunteers, I said, how many innovations have we brought to the DNI conference, uh, and uh, and it turns out that there were 13 of them since we've been working together. So I won't read them all, but um, Gil has already mentioned the workshops and discussion discussion forums, but um, and the scholarships. But um, we've also brought in this best of DNI uh, session and the best poster voting award and the poster slam session because the number of abstracts have grown. We want to try to give as many opportunities for as many attendees. And I think uh, all of this is also that we recognize the value of those best designations, not just to make you feel good, but in career development. And, um, and coming to an event, even a virtual event like this, helps you, you know, refine your thinking, get recognized for, by your peers, learn from your peers. So it's an integral part of professional development as you evolve as a member of the DNI community. Yeah, no, great points. Um, so, uh, as you can see, the, the visuals are changing, and one key part of recent conferences, not just the DNI one, but others, has been uh, social media. So, here we have our annual hashtag. This was DI Science 19, and you can see uh, the, the uh, influence, I think, where we've been able to not only hold the conference in person, and in this case, uh, virtually, you know, online, but can also see the threads, uh, whether it's the specific terms, uh, the, uh, you know, hashtags, et cetera, um, that reflect the, the really nice presence of, uh, of the DNI conference in, in the at least Twitter verse, Twitter space, Twitter verse. Um, so, uh, so with, with that in mind, as we are, uh, really in a, in this virtual space, uh, we're on this right now and we will be, uh, online. Uh, in mid-December. I, I wonder if each of you might be able to talk a little bit about, you know, there's, we've, we've all been trying to learn as we go around trying to make the most of virtual conferences. And, and I wonder if, if, if each of you might talk a little bit about how, uh, as you see the conference plan, uh, planning, how has it really tried to balance, you know, fatigue and engagement, uh, which both of which are, are in abundance. Uh, during all of these virtual meetings. Gila, do you want to start out and just maybe a little bit of the way in which we're trying to think of the conference so that we maximize the opportunity for people to come together uh, with, you know, with constraints in mind? Sure, although it's funny because what I'm going to say is I feel like the model for us has been, you know, I, I attended, Lisa, I attended ARM uh, in whenever that was, June, July, the virtual ARM. And, um, and I thought it was the, those plenary sessions were fabulous the way the chat was set up. And, um, yeah, I, I was really impressed with how we were able to still sort of network and engage almost at a different level when you can, especially for those of us who are um, uh, 
for those of us who need a lot of stimulus all at once to think our best, I loved being able to hear the speakers and have conversations with the participants at the same time. Now, I guess everyone has probably been doing that who tweets. I don't tweet, so for me, it was sort of the first time that I had that experience. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, in some ways there will be, you know, some very cool new things with the virtual space. Um, but we have, you know, tried to come up with creative ways to maintain that sort of networking and community feel. So we'll have, um, and I saw that Samantha Hardin was on, who will be hosting virtual yoga again, which I know is not exactly scientific liaising, but it's such a critical piece to us being effective scientists. Um, so we're so thankful that she's agreed to do that again. We're going to have networking sessions each morning. Um, that's also going to be sort of a meet the experts opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, and Lisa, I think I'll hand it off to you because I'm, uh, you're, you're really the expert in this space. <laughs> uh, well, you know, in the old saying, the, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king or the one-eyed woman, uh, we are just, you know, we have learned so much and had to learn so much in the last eight months. And literally, you know, as we were pivoting the annual research meeting from a fully based program that was going to be in person to a virtual, um, and what we learned, we learned from folks who went a month before us with their conferences, and then we taught folks who were a month behind us, and we're continuing to learn. So a couple of, of the takeaways from ARM was um, that we, because of the Zoom fatigue and the concentrated time, we spread over the, we, first of all, we had to reduce the content. We went from over 150 sessions down to 70, um, just because uh, we just didn't think people would watch it all. And it was cost prohibitive because you have to pre-record all the concurrent sessions and you do the plenaries live. I mean, so, so that's one thing. So, and it just takes so much effort to then pre-record because normally you plan a panel, you have a prep call, but you don't have to record it and all that. So there's, there's a lot more technical training that goes on to make sure you deliver a good product. Um, and I won't go into details on that, but um, we had done the ARM over two weeks and we're just doing the DNI over sort of the regular time frame, somewhat later to accommodate our West Coast folks. Uh, but that's the feedback we got is, no, just give it to us straight. Don't spread it out. We want to do it. Um, the other thing is, is uh, I would speak to your point about the chat. Absolutely. I'm that kind of, you know, multitasking all the time. Um, and, and I'll make some comment about, I understand there's some gender differences in multitasking. I don't know. Um, but um, it, it was easy for me to, and very valuable to follow the chat as well as the speakers. And not just for that, because I was learning so much and so actively engaged. But people were able to share resources um, as they were listening, uh, particularly our sessions around structural racism and health services research. They were saying, well, I read this article or here's a resource kit. And that, you know, it means you're tapping not just the intellect and expertise of the speakers, but the collective. And so this sort of crowdsourcing knowledge was something I've never experienced in real time before. The downside of that, to your point about Twitter, Gila, is that I can only do so much multitasking, and so I was not on Twitter much. And so our our impressions, and so that this social media chart that you have in front of you, do not expect that this coming year, because there's only so much people can do on a screen. And so if they're engaging in the chat, which is so much more fun, because it's really dynamic in a way, um, they're probably not able to tweet. And if they are, my gosh, they have a different brain wiring than I do, because that's a bridge too far for me. Um, I think the network, again, the networking, we've seen some other groups who have done amazing networking events. Some of that is limited by cost, frankly, and, and appropriateness for a scientific meeting. Like I was participating in a, a, a forum with another group, and, and they had um, networking sessions, and one of them was taught by a mixologist on how to make cocktails. I, I don't think that would work at DNI. But, I mean, people are very creative out there. And so um, I, I, I think we're going to continue to learn is, uh, from this event as we look forward to future additional virtual events as this pandemic continues to rage through our country. 
Yeah, thanks for the comments. And thanks, uh, it's, it's been very nice that we've been able to um, use some of the examples that Academy has ha uh, helped us had with this year's ARM or the annual research meeting uh, as, as uh, ARM stands for. Uh, and uh, again, you'll see uh, more pictures of, of uh, past years of, of the wonderful panels that we've had, the occasional musical uh, contributions uh, to, to the event, and then just the really wonderful talks as well. Um, that, that, that you see uh, down uh, to the, the, the bottom left. Um, I did, again, want to encourage uh, any questions to pop up. Uh, we're seeing a few comments uh, aimed for the panelists in the chat, which is great. So thanks so much to those of you uh, who have been sharing your experiences. It's so wonderful to look ahead uh, to seeing some of you join us and maybe your whole teams uh, being able to join us this year. Uh, so that's great. Um, and uh, I guess I did want to just ask a question, uh, and again, we'll see as other questions come in. Uh, as you think about this year coming up, uh, what, what are you looking forward to? What, what is exciting to each of you about uh, the different sessions, the activities? You've mentioned the, uh, the 13 innovations for this 13th meeting, but maybe Lisa and then Gila, you want to talk a little bit about what's, what, what are you excited about, about seeing? So um, I'm excited, there's a lot, but I'm excited because I always learn at the DNI meeting. Um, so there's that learning. And actually that's another thing that happens more on virtual environments for me is when I'm in a physical environment, I love that networking, but that means I don't go to the sessions as much because I'm in the hallways catching up with people. And so I found myself actually learning a lot, which in my you know, current uh, job, I don't get enough time to focus on the science. So I'm really looking forward to continuing that um, virtually. The second thing is that, you know, again, Gila mentioned our scholarships, both patient scholarships and uh, those for uh, participants from low and middle income countries, which we started just a couple years ago with support from NCI and Fogarty. And this year, because it's virtual, I don't know what listserv it went on out over this year, but we got over 500 folks wanting a LMIC scholarship. So I don't know if they're all going to, you know, we, we're, we're hoping most of them can join um, uh, because it's a relatively small additional cost. But, uh, you know, it, that I'm excited about it. If, if we get a large contingent of LMIC folks, I think that'll change the conversation. Um, also, I think that uh, um, some of our patient scholars who attend are absolutely not shy to walk up to the microphone and ask a question. But others are shy. And even though we've had several uh, patient scholars participate, uh, patient representatives, I'm hoping, because I've seen it at ARM, that they're actually a bit more vocal virtually because they can chat, put their question or comment in the chat. So this sort of uh, broader conversation, so we get a more set of diverse voices talking about DNI and what needs to happen. Um, and diversity and inclusion is a big goal to really continue to pers uh, pursue that for Academy Health. So I'm looking forward to those aspects. Well, Lisa said it all and more. So I don't know, I don't have much to add, but I guess the one thing I, I will add is um, I am really looking forward to um, hearing from the plenary panels and the speakers and, and also the, um, you know, in the concurrent sessions in particular, I'm really curious to know what we've learned um, with COVID and um, any lessons learned moving forward with our research and with tackling, um, you know, public health crises. So in addition to all of that, and, and that's incredible, 500, Lisa, I knew it was hundreds. I didn't realize it was that many, um, but that would be, yeah, quite a shift in the conversation and a, um, a, a, a shift, an upward shift in the numbers of attendees as well. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how things play out and, and agree totally with Lisa that because it's virtual, I feel like it will be easier in a way to be present and really learn from the, all the speakers um, in a way that it's harder to do when you're in person. Yeah, and I think, you know, just uh, we, we've had a chance to be on several of the planning calls for the different plenary sessions, and I think both the, the breadth uh, and, and depth of experience and expertise on those panels is going to be awesome, and, and really trying to learn from as many different perspectives as possible has long been a goal for the conference, and, and I, I, I think we're, we're, it's still a, pro, a work in progress, but, but uh, I, progress process. 
but I think we're uh, we're getting there. Um, so, and maybe yeah. we're not supposed to talk about who we invited and declined our invitation, but I will mention it's interesting to see that a couple of the people we had initially invited and declined are now being tapped for or, or being considered for um, future administration roles. So that's exciting too. <laughs> sure. Um, so I uh, did want to uh, ask a question uh, for, for those who have yet to attend a conference and might be tuning in to just get more of a sense of this whole environment. I think we've known in the past that the, the first time conference goers have, have, have said that it feels like there's so much that's coming at them. And I wonder if each of you might be able to either give suggestions, um, maybe maybe it is just no either, but give suggestions for how those who are new to the conference might be able to both prepare for it and how do they make the most of uh, this uh, this uh, vast amount of information. Uh, Gila, do you want to start and then Lisa? Uh, sure. So <laughs> I think the first advice I give is close your email. <laughs> so you don't get distracted because um, there will be a lot um, and, and I think it'll just make very less, yeah, I think it'll be helpful. But, um, you know, the website, the conference website that Academy Health has uh, put together, it's, it's always useful to just go through and see what's coming up and there's, I believe there's a tool where you can actually schedule out your session so you can pick in advance. Um, and. Yeah, I think uh, those two things are the first things that come to my mind. So what I would add is, um, you know, speak up in the chat and don't be afraid to reach out to people. And this is sort of going back, not particularly to DNI, but to my experience when I started in the field of in health services research. Some of these names or people you'll hear speaking are like, wow, that's that person who I've been reading from and I've been I've read all their articles or I've got their textbook. And so it's a bit daunting, um, but don't be afraid to reach out to them, you know, even privately and say, oh, I've really read, you know, I'd love to schedule a follow up. Can we have a conversation? You might get some no's, but it doesn't hurt to ask um, because um, it is a community. And I think there's a real commitment in everybody I've met to um, to help with the professional development of folks who are newer to the field. I hate to say younger because we all come to this field uh, at different times. Um, so so take the initiative. I think that it'll be um, well received. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I think you know just personally, one of the really uh, the highlights of of the conference each year has been uh, the the chance to connect with folks who I haven't gotten to know. And so I'll just speak for myself that I'd love even if it's more of a virtual contact this year, I would love if, if folks wanted to follow up and whether it's just giving your impressions about how does it work this year in the virtual space or you want to chat about the field, that's one of the things that, that we really do enjoy as our uh, community continues to grow. Um, I it also, I just wonder, you know, in the last few years, what we've been able to do in person and what we now have available online uh, is sessions around orienting people uh, to DNI research, so you don't feel like the first things that you are hearing about don't have that broader context of how does this fit into the larger um, uh, community, the advance of the field, and so you can definitely take advantage of it. And, and Lisa, I can't remember if it, this year the orientation that we've had in the past is on the website. I know it's a, uh, on on the NCI website, um, but just a way to try and not feel like the first time you're hearing these terms is in some of these sessions where people are speaking uh, about more. Uh, more and, specifics. Yeah. And also, um, yes, look at the orientation and uh, so you get sort of exposed to these concepts. And after the meeting, there are other resources you can access to further, you know, deepen your exposure to that. And one of the things I want to flag um, is that David wrote a blog for us, oh, maybe 18 months ago at this point, the world has, you know, time has gone so fast, um, that um, uh, highlights the six modules within uh, a training program that I think historically those modules and that uh, online training was restricted to tighter and now it's available more broadly. I, I don't know the history, but uh, there's a lot out there for you to follow up on so that you can continue to deepen your understanding and, and ability to use the tools of DNI. Right, and you'll see if you're if you're monitoring the chat, you'll see a couple of links that, that Gila and Sarah just put in 
both to the orientation to DNI on our uh, NCI IS website and also on the Academy Health website, uh, as, as Gila says, toward the bottom of the page says the orientation video. So those are intended to make, you know, everything that we try and do uh, is really intended to try and make those resources available. Um, what Lisa mentioned was our Training Institute and Dissemination Implementation Research in Cancer, which Sarah uh, has led uh, for multiple years and has become, uh, well, since it began, and has become this open access opportunity for anyone, really, to, to access the, the, the lectures, the assignments, et cetera. Um, so we do have a question in here that asks, uh, as an assumption, and curious what you think about it, that one advantage of an online conference uh, is that thanks to recordings, you really can see everything. And I wonder if you might be able to talk about how are the materials that are going to be presented, Lisa, you mentioned pre-recording, uh, how, how are they going to be available and, and for what duration? Lisa, do you want to take that one? Sorry. Yes, um, great question. So, um, trying to remember how long we're making them available, maybe David remembers, but yes, thanks to the virtual platform, not only will you have the recording, but you can then access it after the meeting itself. In addition, we, um, any uh, speaker who gives permission, we um, make their slides available. Again, that's based on the speaker. That may not be 100%. And sometimes we also, um, there's usually a resource center and there are additional resources made available. And we do, Gila mentioned all our partners and sponsors, they make resources available or funding opportunities and new publications, et cetera. And so I would really encourage you to, you know, uh, ask, um, access all the functionalities and, um, and, and the background materials that, that speakers uh, provide. Great, thanks. Aguila, anything to add? Uh, for some reason, I was thinking it was a, a year, but maybe that was just ARM was a year, and I don't know if that's what we're planning for DNI, but. It's several months. Um, okay. It's not as long as ARM. Um, okay. but, yeah, recognizing that, uh, you know, these recordings should be viewed. And so uh, we know that every year it's been so hard where people will look at the agenda and say to us, you know, there's two, three, maybe four sessions at the same time that uh, I, I have to choose between. And, and yes, the hope is that, you know, again, as much bandwidth as you have, uh, that you'll have a reasonable amount of time to be able to check back. Um, yeah, one of the things we say, David, is no more FOMO. No more fear of missing out. You don't have to make those tough choices. Right. Sarah, did you want to jump I was going to say one of our very helpful uh, attendees mentioned that per the conference website, it's through January 2021. So thank you, Danielle. <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. Great. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I do see a question here about the, the six modules, and, and that is the, the tighter uh, training in student dissemination implementation research in cancer. Um, that has the the modules online, and so Sarah, did you 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 could put that maybe? So if you want to read oh, more yeah. about the blog Lisa mentioned, that is that links to all those. That is in the chat, and I'm going to go ahead and add the direct link to those modules in the chat as well. Actually, it looks like uh, Gila I, did. Yes, yeah. I did. Perfect. Right. Okay. Yes, we try and be uh, you know be be cover things uh, and. Uh, sometimes we're redundant, but in this case, not perfect timing. Uh, so you'll see in front of you uh, the question slide. You see that we've all, for a long time, if you've tuned in before, uh, we've had this fireside uh, theme, fireside chats. Uh, this realizing that fires, to a certain degree, inside can be more dangerous. Um, this is a very small fire, really a spark, a, a match, but giving you the sense of the light that we're trying to provide here. Um, so we would love to see if there's any final questions that you have as we as we get closer to to the end of this. But I wanted to ask one more, and that's kind of you know for people who are in earlier stages of their career, um, any additional suggestions you have for folks really trying to take make the most of this opportunity? And again, sometimes what you spoke about before, where there may be that hesitance. Uh, to reach out to folks if you feel like, well, I, I, I'm not sure if they would consider me a peer. But any any su other suggestions that you say, how would you uh, mentor somebody to make the most uh, who's at an earlier stage of their career of this conference? Um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, am I supposed to go first, or who are you asking? Uh, I, I think that would be wonderful, Lisa. I had no uh, order in mind. Sorry. 
Um, so my my uh, additional thought is, whoever is um, your mentor or uh, you know somebody who is tra helping with your training and developing your profession, um, if they you know review the program of speakers always. I recommend this. Who are the speakers? And if you don't know them and feel a little shy about reaching out directly, like I said earlier, go to your mentor. Hopefully, you have more than one. You have a mentoring team. And ask them, do they know this person? Could they introduce you pre before the conference? And so that way that you've already made that warm handoff, and then you can listen to that person, maybe make a connection there, do some networking there or afterwards as well. Um, because building your network and using your mentors is critically important. Um, I would also say, don't don't just go to the sessions that you think are the closest to what part of DNI you're studying or the content you're studying. I mean, I'm a pediatrician health services researcher with a background in public health. When I started going to academy health meetings at the annual research meeting, I went to the sessions that were all econometric and economic analyses because I didn't understand that. I didn't know anything about it. Expose yourself to different ways of thinking. Broaden your toolkit um, because DNI is very much a team science and it's, a, it's so much about understanding context and and so you you need to learn from that multidisciplinary uh, representation in our field. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I guess the only thing I would add is you know take advantage of the workshops, and this year you can do so for all of them actually. Um, and uh, also, if if you don't have a mentor who would be helpful in um, making those connections then um, I wouldn't be shy to reach out to folks on the planning committee. And you can see all of us listed um, on the website if you go to the about, about the conference page and scroll down. You can see all the planning committee members. So if you know any of them, reach out to them. If you don't know any of them, pick, you know, feel free to reach out to them. And, um, and yeah, and feel free to email us. And, um, you know, there have been many people actually who have emailed me and I've tried to connect them with the appropriate people and I'd be glad to continue to do that. Great, and there was a, I'm gonna uh, just uh, note that there was a, que a very specific question about uh, almost could, could the conference be like an a la carte menu where you might sign up for a particular session and, and, and sort of pay as you go. Uh, and to this point, I think it's been more of a, you register for the broader uh, broader conference and have access to everything, but but appreciate that the note the question here being that that some clinicians may not have time or other busy folks may not have time to attend everything, but there might be specific things that they want to attend. So uh, good good for us to always think about these things. Maybe uh, Lisa's uh, and just to, to jump in, that's one of the things because of our the virtual push. Um, that we're talking about with ARM content as well is how do we then repackage some of the content and make it available in smaller modules of digestible, you know, it's not, uh, you know, whatever number of sessions, 40, 50 sessions we have. So, um, uh, but I would just say that there's no way we're deconstructing the main event that I can think of because um, the business model for that, it's just, you know, there are certain fixed costs to producing this kind of scientifically driven agenda in terms of review and solicitation, et cetera. So I, it would be hard for me to imagine that we would do away with the package, but that we're hoping to repurpose some of that content and just looking at models. We haven't figured it out, but it's it's a future conversation. Yeah, but, but absolutely appreciate the, the question and, and, and we'll continue to, to see what we can do to, to reach as many people as possible in, in whatever way they can access. The great thing here is and, and Lisa and, and Gila both mentioned it in terms of the, the larger percentage of people who may be attending around the world is that the virtual environment does make it easier for those not to have to upend their uh, daily routine, but potentially, you know, to, to tune in from where they are and even tune in uh, at a time that's more conducive to them. Uh, so for me, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to close us out, I just want to say that this uh, yet again, uh, gives me uh, vigor and enthusiasm for, for what's to come. So, Lisa and Gila, thank you for sharing your wisdom and sharing your spirit and, and the good things to, to look for, the good advice for folks. Um, it, it will be great. Uh, and so we hope that all of you and many more uh, are able to join. So with that, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Gila. And let me turn it over to Sarah.
So I'm going to echo David's thanks to our wonderful speakers. I think that it is very evident how welcoming and friendly folks in this field are. I think you can take that away from this conversation, and hopefully you will join us at our annual conference this year virtually to engage further with folks um, in the chat, on Twitter, et cetera. So an archive of today's session will be available shortly on our website, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021 for another year of great implementation science webinars. Thank you again for joining us. You may disconnect at this time. Take care, everyone.